Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ruth Dickey, and I have the tremendous pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's event presented in partnership with the Bay Area Book Festival. And wow, it's getting darker in here. It's getting exciting. I'm in this way. <laughs> Our warm and heartfelt thanks to Nora Peel, Scott Gelplin, Sherilyn Parsons, and the whole Bay Area Book Festival team. We're so happy to be in Berkeley, California to celebrate National Book Award honored authors and their work. Some of you may know the National Book Foundation is the presenter of the National Book Awards, which has honored the best literature in America since 1950. Through the support of readers like you and the Mellon Foundation, we work year-round to reach readers everywhere through our education and public programming online and in person in 43 states and counting to get authors on stages and books into readers' hands. If you're interested in learning more about our work, you can visit our website and sign up for our newsletter at nationalbook.org. Today we're gathered for a conversation on poetics and performance with National Book Award honored authors Hanif Abdurraqib and Douglas Kearney, moderated by UC Berkeley professor Dr. Brandy Wilkins Catanese. I'm just juggling pages, sorry. <laughs> the authors will read about their work and then we'll open up at the end a few audience questions. If you have a question, please just raise your hand and Brandy will call on you. Following the event, the authors will move over to the book signing area with extra thanks to Marcus Books for joining us for today's as today's bookseller. And now I'm delighted, wait, to introduce our authors. <laughs> Hanif Durakib is a poet, essayist, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. Hanif is the author of the poetry collections, The Crown Ain't Worth Much, which was nominated for a Kirsten Wright Legacy Award, and A Fortune for Your Disaster, winner of the 2020 Lenore Marshall Prize. His first collection of essays, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, was named a book of the year by BuzzFeed, Esquire, NPR, and Oprah Magazine, among others. Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest, was a New York Times bestseller, a finalist for the Kirkus Prize, and longlisted for the National Book Award. And A Little Devil in America was a finalist for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Penn Diamante Spring, Spring Vogel Award for the Art of the Essay. The book won the 2022 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction and the Gordon Byrne Prize. Hanif is a graduate of Beechcroft High School. Douglas Kearney has published seven collections, including the National Book Award and Pan America Finalist Show and Buck Studies, winner of the Theodore Retke Memorial Poetry Award, the CLMP Firecracker Award, and the California Book Award. Kearney is the disaster of no podium, sorry. Also the author of the collection of the libretti, Someone Took They Tongues, Mess and Mess and a small press distribution handpicked selection and Fodder, a live album featuring Kearney and collaborator Val Inc. Kearney is the 2021 recipient of Opera America's Campbell Opera Librettist Prize. His operas include Sucked, Suction, Mordake, Crescent City, Sweetland, the music critics of North America's best opera of 2021, and Comet Popea. He has received a Whiting Writers Award, a Foundation for Contemporary Arts Cy Twombly Award for Poetry, and fellowships from Cave Canem, the Rauschenberg Foundation. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Altadena, California, Kearney teaches creative writing at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and lives in St. Paul with his family. And our moderator, Brandy Wilkins Catanese, is an associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Department of African American Studies and Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. She writes and teaches about race and the politics of representation, and is the author of The Problem of Color Blind, Racial Transgression, and the Politics of Black Performance. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy the program. Absolutely be joining in. <laughs> 
Well, you know, sometimes her former Aretha didn't really remember the words either. God, <laughs> God rest her soul. You know. She just transcended words. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't really need them. That is absolutely correct. Um, yeah, I'm a total goof, and I don't have my paper. So what I'll say very quickly is just um, that I deeply appreciate this opportunity to facilitate um, and want to um, express gratitude for this collaboration between the National uh, Book Foundation and the San Francisco Literary Foundation. And I'd like to turn it over to our authors um, to read a brief excerpt from their work as they are so moved. And if you would like to have access to the podium so that you are a bit more hands-free, I'm happy to relocate it because I also love many shows <laughs> I think I'll be all right. Okay. Yeah. What do you, what do you, I, I get anxious going after you. Okay, well, uh, well please. Okay. You go, you go. There's like no <laughs> nice way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Salute. Um, I was going to read something out of Little Devil, but because Doug and I were talking about this part of my book, the new book I'm working on that's about baldness, that tricks people into thinking it's about basketball, uh, but it's about, how we're all going to die one day. <laughs> um, it's true. Uh, so I'm going to read a part of that. I'm going to read it. it. It's about Michael Jordan and the 85 dunk contest, but it's also about um, how much I love flying home. I'm going to start in the middle of a sentence. I can also tell that I don't really fuck with leaving my house anymore because I don't know if anyone knows, but my very first impulse when being in front of a table is to put my feet on it, <laughs> which is how I know that I'm like conditioned to not physically be present with you all. <laughs> and yet here I am. <laughs> there was a way to be cool on whatever befalls your, there was a way to be cool on the other side of whatever befalls your scalp, which is funny to me because Mike was never as cool as he was in 85 when he showed up to the dunk contest with thick, tightly coiled patches of hair making up a hairline that was fighting for whatever little life it had left if you look closely. If you are the type who has loved or known a black person whose hair has begun to retreat along their dome, Mike would shave all that shit off in 89, but at the dunk contest in 85, he had yet to cross the threshold that would define him. And I propose that the difference difference between being naked and being bare is that in a state of nakedness, the end can be seen even if it hasn't arrived yet. It has less to do with what one is or isn't wearing or showing and has more to do with how poorly they keep the inevitable hidden or how long a person can hold back the undoing that awaits them. But in 85, it wasn't the hair and it wasn't even the fact that Mike lost the contest. It is a photo of him soaring towards a basket, his arm cradling the rock with ill intentions, eyeing the rim like prey. And Mike took flight in a pair of kicks the NBA had banned, and the gold, yes, the gold, stretching up along his neck, almost angling towards his open mouth while he was in the air. Some might say that in any consideration of flight, one must also consider the excess weight of anything that might render them closer to the earth than to the sky. But one must also consider that you don't show up with gold if you only plan to take it off. There are those who demand to be buried with all their gold on, to reach heaven, perhaps still wrapped in the arms of their earthly jewels. And Mike was never never as cool as he was when he climbed towards the sky with two gold chains around his neck, ascending two, so there could be no mistake about the miraculous air that refused to let MJ down. I believe no gold to be subtle. I believe nothing to be subtle when it can be snatched from a neck in order to feed a family. But Mike said, again, you're going to have to catch me. You're going to have to climb, and I know you want no parts of the world from this high up. Find the point where you are unkillable and jump towards it if you can. And Mike was never as cool as he was in 85 when he hadn't yet begun to take a blade to his scalp when he started at one end of Market Square Arena in Indianapolis and ran, catapulting himself from the free throw line, yes, the actual free throw line, and remaining suspended and extended for what feels, even now, like a glorious hour, your finest hour, the hour you've dreamed of living again ever since the final grains of it kissed the mountains of sand at the bottom of the hourglass. Have you ever been in the air for so long that your feet began to fall in love with the new familiar, walking along some invisible surface that surely must be there, as there is 
no other way to describe what miracle keeps you afloat. How long have you been suspended in a place that loves you with the same ferocity and freedom as the ground might, as the grave might, as a heaven that lets you walk in drowning in gold might? And when Mike finally came back down to earth, gold in the exact same place it was when he took flight, he simply pumped his fist, clapped his hands a little bit. Mike was never as cool as he was right then, in the moment directly after his singular defiance of routines of both flight and flyness, smiling to himself like he was waking from a dream, a good dream, a dream where no one can kill you but you. And even now, I wish to touch the hem of that type of cool to ascend and then return knowing the world has all been altered before I landed and there is no reason for me to be longing for this right now except for the fact that I am looking up at the sky and thinking again of the most cartoon version of heaven a place overcrowded with people whose names I have brought back to life whose names I have scrubbed the dirt off of long after winters have weighed their headstones down with the treachery of the season a place where the dead have nothing better to do but watch the living they loved and still love watching all the sweetness lurking around the corners that we ourselves cannot see shaking their heads as we deny ourselves our waiting miracles this is a self-indulgent way to imagine life after this life but I have massaged all other meaning I can out of the sky out of the shapes of clouds the arms oranges and the reds that fight their way through them while the sun laughs its way to surrender. I have led us astray again, I know. I meant only to talk about gold, which is both a color and a state of being, though definitely a color, one I have seen knocking tenderly on the glass of a window in an airplane in the early moments of descent, right after waking and sliding open the plastic lid, temporarily quieting the shining empire of light, which, if you are lucky, greets you at just the right distance, where you can see where you are going and see what is carrying you there, which means, if you are me and you are coming back to Columbus, you can see the yawning mouths of stadiums bursting with green, and you can see the familiar buildings, the ones you might take for granted if you live in a place long enough and forget to look skyward all that often and yes with the plane tilting at the right hour the gold from the sky can make its way across your newly awakened eyes the color itself two hands nudging you home and this is why i must believe there are my people beyond the clouds draped in some exquisite shit untucking the shine just as a reminder michael jordan was coolest when he was close to them alone statuesque and still but for the stadium lights dancing along the gold around his neck sending a signal to somewhere someone Sending a signal to someone somewhere. Yes, my beloveds, it is all this talk of gold and skies that makes me want to jump towards you now, even with my sturdy head of hair and my legs not having as much give as they used to. My God, how I miss you all. My God, how I pray to be buried in whatever decoration will allow me to arrive to you again clean. Mm. Is that the first time you've read that excerpt out, out in, in public? I think so. I think it's the first time I read that part last. What, what, what world premiere? <laughs> nice. I mean, I had this feeling, you know, after you came to the U that time and you read yeah. the dance piece, and I was like, oh, shit, the next one, like, We'll talk about this more, but I want oh, to yeah, talk I about- Oh, I forgot that I read, I, yeah. I read an early draft of that dance You read an shit. early, dra an early I, draft of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that more, because I actually- something you said earlier about sentences and now okay anyway all right so i'm gonna do two two things um and the first is because we just had a what, what, what world premiere uh one of the kind of uh genres and and i'm that's all the french i'm gonna use today because i'm a patriot um one of one of them is uh is the uh the brand new dance song and this is oftentimes uh used when black folks create something within black communities um, but then it starts to cross over. So there's, a, there's, there's an attempt to, sort of, so I'm gonna read one brand new dance poem in honor of the brand new, brand new essay we heard, and then I'm gonna read the title poem from this. Do the backseat jam. Stop there, fam, and jump to the brand spanking. Back again, you know how it go. Throw your hands in the air when the light's on. Maestro, raise the baton and swing till you feel it. The beat what's taking over the street to the club. When I say you say, ow, it thumps. Let me see those hands for all the people in the be quiet. Get down on the floor like you know. This will be the short shot hit. Sweat through your clothes. You want it, you got it, you better put your hands. Get ready for the, you ain't ready for the, you. You gotta listen up just as easy as falling off a countdown. Three, do it till it's done. To the two, to the ones in blue. Show them what you said to do. To the zeros in brown. To the back, to the back, to the back. Now you write the jam. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll read the title poem uh, 
uh, which is... I love this poem so much. Aw, oh, shit. <laughs> Hanif Abdurkeep loves one of my poems. <laughs> Please mark this date. No, I'm... For, for, you, you think I'm being sarcastic, but no. <laughs> like, no, I... Yeah. Anyway, okay, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. So I'm not going to do all that now. Be a professional. So this is a segue. Um, show uh, the poem. Show is written in the form of a torsion, which is an, a poetic form one of my students invented, sort of modeled after a sestina. So it's, it's kind of intermittent recursion. Show. Some need some body or more to ape sweat on some site. Bloody pearl or dirty spit hocked up for to show who gets eaten. Rig body up, bow, bow to breeze a lay's jig and sway to Griggs good fiddling. Pine deep dusk, a spot where stood body thus they clap when I mount bonk, jig up the lectern, bow to say it's all good. We gathered, withstood the bends of dives deep, darker, they clap as I get down. Sweat highlights my body, how meats died bloody, look fresher for show. Wing, I got deep, spit out my mouth, a rigid red rhyme, bloody melon, ha, no sweat, joking, nobody knows the trouble, rig full of Dale, show why I fixed this mess, spit in tragedy's good eye, this one's called Jig Gugglers, then bow housefully, they clap, be misunderstood, hang notes high or deep, make my tongue a bow. What's the gift? My good song box? The gift! Chick little nickels from deep down my crawl. They clap! I so jolly. Stood on that bank. Body picked over blood. E. Rato. Braxton sweat. E. Brow syndrome. Spit out of sax bell. Rig a negrocious show of feels. For show sweat equals work. Bloody ink pot of body. I stay nib dip. Show never run dry. Rick. Durously, I spit out stressed feet. Lines jig. Ha, 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 ha. Good one that I is bow deep, but not out. Stood shining dim. They clap. Weave slapping holes deep. Don't mean sunken. Goods. Not yummy, right? Bow blanched with foam. Jig jigs. This one's called they clap. Make a wheel. Barrow so much deep ends upon dead. Stood I on that bloody rise of sweet body. There you is too. Sweat, it lets they clap, right? Some ass post, spit to lip. I said, show. Thank you both so much for um, kicking us off with sharing a bit of your um, work. And can you hear me sufficiently? Is this picking up a bit? OK. Um, so what I'd love to start by asking the two of you um, is about performance, in light of the fact that that's one of the words in the title. Um, it's come up in discussions of your work. Um, it's the subject of your work in certain ways. Um, there's a way to think about performance as product, right? How you locate something in the genre of performance. That is a performance. Um, and that is useful, but I'm also wanting to hear, especially after your readings, how notions of performance factor into your creative process, the development of the work itself. Um, It seems like the work that you produce has to be a, a sort of, has to emerge from a very deeply embodied process. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, like performance, first of all, I really appreciate the question. Thank you yeah. all for being here and thank you for moderating. Um, you know, performance as content, like the material about which we're oftentimes both writing, um, always to me, I'm, I'm always thinking about it, pushing it towards that space that is both practice and theory, right? That, that idea of praxis. Mm -hmm. So what do we discover 
about a text in performance? Yeah. What do we what do we discover about a relation between like myself and a room full of people um, during performance? And so what I write is oftentimes a kind of like an angler flip fish lantern to create the sociality, mm -hmm. right? And once we're in that space, then I can actually do the work that performance is asking about. Um, and so I think about that a lot. Um, so it's both the material, but then it's also, it's also the mode. And there was a moment in my readings where I became much less interested in the poems than I was what happens between the poems and that kind of unscripted banter space. And that became the part that I was more excited about um, because that was gonna be kind of different every time. And it was also closer to how I'm thinking when I write the poem. If I hear a sound or somebody laughs or anything like that, then I'm bringing that in and associating with that in the, in the act of delivering the poems and the performance. So, so I would say that that, that, that I mean, it's, it's the both and that you started off talking about, honestly. I tend to, sorry that I've gotten exceedingly comfortable. Uh, Please do also feature the kicks. <laughs> a performance in and of itself, sure. I um, I tend to think of memory retrieval as a, as a source of performance mm. because if I am to believe, as I do, that memory is a privilege, right? Like not only something by that I don't only mean something that we are privileged to be able to retain. I mean to have a relationship with one's memories that are not wholly traumatic. Um, then to go into the well of memory and to retrieve something, it's, it's like when you're, um, when you're fishing for something and you pull up the net and you've got to sift through the, the gross shit to find the, the thing. Mm -hmm. That is a performance within myself, I think. Um, we, we were talking about antagonizing, how, how the performer can antagonize an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about that before we were here. Um, and I sometimes feel like in the draft phase, I am antagonizing my past selves almost, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like I'm in I'm in a I'm in a combative relationship with what I know of my own flawed memory, and I think to even that act of sparring with myself, sparring with what I know about my past, to create something that you all can understand as clean, that is perhaps the highest level of performance that I achieve, and no one sees it, mm -hmm. right? Like no one sees it but me no one has to deal with the aftermath of it but me. And I maybe think that's the truest form of performance there can be. Like, I, I, I once, um, I recently did a profile on two musicians, on Gillian Welch and David Rawlings. Mm -hmm. And David Rawlings told me this story about how Johnny Cash, they performed with Johnny Cash near the end of his life, like very end of his life, at some award show. And he was like, listen, you know, Johnny was, he was bent over. He couldn't stand up straight. He was like coughing and all. He was just like unwell. But a couple minutes before he, there was a spotlight on the stage that he had to step into. And a couple minutes before he stepped in that spotlight, he stood up straight. He adjusted his tie and he walked out. And he was that bad motherfucker he always was, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but in order to cross the threshold from who you are to the bad motherfucker people know you to be, there, there's a performance that no one else sees, or to see it as a privilege, right? To be a witness to it as a privilege, and so I think that's that's really how the you know the work for me comes to be is is trying to um, convince my present self that my past self was not only unworthy of occupying pages. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the term like persona poetry, and right. I always think that that's redundant because. Right anything you write is persona. Like this is the reflective, you know, magnanimous version of me. Like this is, and what you said really crystallizes this picture for me and how you talked about the dredging through the muck, right? Because right. the muck, the only way to not be writing in persona is if you just splack the whole thing out and say, find your lost ring, your damn self. Like that's, <laughs> like that's, that's, that's closer to non-persona and even that, will be persona because like, you know, you're filtering it through language, which, you know, you know, is it oftentimes a stand in. So I really appreciate what you're saying about like the act of writing, drafting, yeah. choosing, selecting, composing what you're actually going to write down is this kind of performance and persona work. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I'd love to invite you to share a little bit with us of what you uh, discussed before, this question of antagonism, <laughs> the idea of antagonizing your readers, antagonizing yeah. your past self. Um, to what degree is that um, a consistent part of your process or an inevitability, <laughs> shall we I feel say? Like, well, this came up because I was talking about how I, I, I just did a workshop on sound and I showed a video of Doug performing show at 92 to 92nd Street Y. Because I really do love that poem. Like, I love that poem on the page, and I love that poem. Like, I have heard you read that poem now, maybe this is maybe my fifth time, and it never sounds the same, right? Like, it always... And it's like you said, you, you mentioned the thing about the, the drum machine. So, like, the, yeah, like, the we clap, the repetitions thing sounds the same, but the amount... Like, there was... The 92nd Street Y performance, I wish there was a projector where you play it on, because that felt particularly antagonistic because of the way you end you know, the, the the when you land on show at the end, it is almost with a, an air of disgust. You know what I mean? And I feel like I that performance. I don't know when that was from, but I feel like that was before the book came out. That yeah, was like yeah, early, was, early. Yeah, that was that was probably about. Yeah, because we were still traveling. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so that must have been at the latest. It could have been was like 2019. And so we were talking about this idea of when I played it for these these people and, and people's responses to it were kind of like, well, I felt like I was on the defensive. Like I felt like I was defending myself against whatever was happening on the stage. And I think that's a good place to be. That's a guy, you know, I don't, um, I'm not the kind of performer who can kind of um, strike that level of, I don't even want to say fear, but awareness of just making people aware that there is a defense mechanism that they should be perhaps reaching for, right? Mm -hmm. I grew up on the punk scene, you know, it, which, as I get older, I feel like that makes its way into almost like every 10 sentences. <laughs> um, but there, there's a sense there of like, when you come up, in Little Devil in America, I write about this Fallout Boy show where the stage collapsed at Knights of Columbus in Chicago in the basement. Um, and I remember that being like the only show in my life and I've been to some like pretty intense, I grew up on a pretty intense hardcore scene, but that was the only show where I was like, there is a potential that I might die. Mm. And of course I was like 20, so I was like, sweet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and I'm not saying audiences should feel that, but I remember being like, there's something about pushing, the, the pushing to the brink. And again, I'm not saying that you make people feel like you want to die, but you said, I'm saying that there's like a, what came, it was what came after that where it was like, how can I survive? Like I'm asking questions of the defense mechanism that's like built into me. And I think that kind of, we talked about Chuck D and the kind of antagonism that Chuck D brings, but since your work embodies that, I think you probably have a better answer than I do. <laughs> I mean, so I once did a reading in Texas and in the middle of the reading, somebody was drinking a bottle, like big bottle of Arizona iced tea and they dropped it. Like this was a plastic kind, so it just hits the ground. And I just stopped. I got up, I walked off stage, I went to the back of the auditorium and grabbed a dumpster on a set of wheels. I rolled it back up to this person, it was just like, they put it in. And then I was like, you know what, fuck it. Who else has trash? And I started walking around the room, like to collect all the trash, walked it all the way back to the back, got up, went back to the stage, kind of climbed up on stage. But that was, that was, inv that was vigorous work, so I, I drank my water bottle and finished it. Then I was like, fuck. Went back to the back of the room, grabbed the trash barrel again, wheeled it back up to the stage, took my water bottle, dropped it in, went back to the back of the room, the trash barrel came back. Um, readings are this wild triangle. Um, I think it's edification, mm -hmm. right? Um, economics. Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the last one I, I, call, I, I call it? Oh, there's there's a there's a third thing. It's it's like we want entertainment, entertainment, right? Now a lot of people don't want to think about a literary reading as a form of entertainment, but it actually is, right? And what's interesting about it is like it's an entertainment that we do because it's good for us. It's the it's the entertainment equivalent to eating steamed cauliflower, right? <laughs> like like so you do it and you might enjoy it. I'm not saying like you don't like, but but that's in there. And so people don't they want a reading to be good or moving or compelling, but they don't want to say entertaining because that moves it too close to capital and economics, right? But the economics are there. There's cultural capital from going to this literary event and demonstrating that you can be edified by it. 
that's cultural capital, right? Um, and also the venue that's hosting it, there, there's maybe a cover charge or we're selling our books. There's, so there's econ economics there too. But that edification is what makes it all kind of like comfortable. It makes it feel like it's good, right? And this is reality, right? That's there. What I'm interested in, and I think this is a certain level of the antagonism, I'm interested in reminding us during the course mm -hmm. of the reading that there is a transaction that's yeah. supposed to be happening and I'm not doing it because I'm walking around the room picking up trash, right? Like, like something that we're supposed to be doing. And this puts us in the position to pay attention to what's supposed to happen. And then that puts us in a position to begin to ask questions. Well, why, why are, okay, so what's supposed to happen? The other thing that I will add to that is, I, is and I make this argument in a, in a lecture that turns to this long ass essay called I Killed, I Died, Banter, Self-Destruction in the Poetry Reading. Um, and that is that actually, even though we're the ones with mics, the sign of power in this space is the ability to not say anything. If we get up here, we are expected to speak or else we have transgressed. You all have the power to either be quiet, to be appreciative, or rupture the performance by doing something out of bounds. That's a great deal of power when you think about it. Um, I once did a reading once where this guy just got up in the middle of one of my poems and said, parasites, parasites, and walked out. I was like, <laughs> he won. Like, like if that was a slight, he won, <laughs> right? Right? So I think about those kinds of things and I'm interested in reminding us where we are whenever we're encountering each other. Yeah. Like I want my poems, I feel like my poems work in a certain kind of way such that you don't get to escape in, an, in a beautiful image or a metaphor. I don't use as many metaphors. I don't use a lot of images as much as I use just word sound against each other and signifying on that because I want you to feel very present with the, with the work. And that's something that I think of here as well. Yeah. And so I do think that sometimes that can be kind of antagonistic, but yeah. yeah. But an audience has, I mean, I, I came up in Poetry Slam where you are the veil of antagonism between you and audiences is <laughs> right. just the right. thinnest it can possibly be. Right. Um, Little Devil I write about the Apollo where there is no veil. Right, exactly. You're getting yanked off that motherfucker, you know? Right, right, right. It's like, bound literally. to happen. It yeah. is going to happen. Yeah. And so <laughs> there's also a way that um, to it with an with an empowered audience comes an empowered performer, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. if we were to talk about the exchange, mm -hmm. and I've talked a lot about how shows or readings, or whatever can be an exchange in all these pretty flowery ways. But when there's actually a an empowered audience, that doesn't really need your shit, right? Then that, that's that's where the real exchange happens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you see, if you watch any of those old videos from the Apollo, the motherfuckers who get booed and don't stop, you know, that can go one of two ways. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You get some like Lauren Hill shit where you know you you can win them back, but more often than not, a motherfuckers coming on that stage with a cane, yep. and you getting pulled off. Same. Man. Yeah, you know, so in that that to me, this is maybe my tough love thing. This is maybe my like my trauma from being coached by two too hype too many hyper masculine coaches when I was a kid comes out. But I think that makes a better performer mm -hmm. when an audience is empowered in that way to kind of curate to curate what they want and what they don't have time for. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. That's interesting to me. What do you think are the conditions for um, meeting an empowered audience? Do you somehow, um, do you have a role in that? Or are you just vulnerable to what's, what's going to face you when you um, arrive at a space of encounter? Do you think that your work perhaps um, speaks especially to an audience that's going to show up empowered or? That's risky. Because <laughs> you, know, you don't know who's going to show up. You don't know who's going to show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would, I would argue that, that an audience that recognizes itself as having basically the force of an ensemble yeah. is, is an empowered audience. Mm -hmm. So like, if you go to the Apollo, you know you have a job to do. Like yeah. you're supposed, somebody is supposed to get, like, like, 
Like, there should be only one. Like, and everyone band. in the room has a job. And everybody in the room has a job. Everyone has a job. At the world stage um, in Los Angeles, the coffee shop, they have a sign in front before all of their poetry workshops and open mics. It just says, no bullshit. It's just a sign of a bull taking a shit and a Ghostbuster sign through it. <laughs> Which means the audience is like, oh, we're here to make sure no bullshit happens. And so like that, you come to a space that's pre-prepared. I, I don't I, I don't know if, if it would if it would have that same vibe if I came in and said, okay, now if you don't like something, do like do this. I don't know if that would be the yeah, same thing. Nah. Right? Because when what I loved about coming up in Poetry Slam was you could feature so I, you know, the earliest tours I did were just like features, Greyhound features. You just mm -hmm. go from city to city and you do little slam venues. And every host would give you, you know, be like, we don't put up with no bullshit here. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean in Atlanta, Georgia <laughs> right, versus right. Philadelphia? Right. Completely you know what different. I mean? And so there is a code that we are not, we, the performers from Columbus, Ohio, like I, I can, at the best I can do is align myself towards, this is why it is important to have the open mic first before the feature. Yeah. <laughs> because I can, I can, I have enough self-awareness <laughs> to align myself towards whatever no bullshit means in the context of what I am seeing. Right. And that also empowers an audience, right? Yeah. yeah. To have... There's a way to be an active participant, like, all right, everybody clap along, everybody hum along. But it's another thing to say, I'm gonna watch your poems first. Mm -hmm. Because when this one, when this dude says no bullshit, I'm gonna see what bullshit you might or might not be on, mm -hmm. and then align myself towards, if I must, align myself <laughs> firmly outside of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's also a code of, you know, there are codes of conduct that I think are regional or, and, and not even conduct in a way that's buttoned up. I mean, like a, a code of audience engagement. Mm -hmm that I enjoy being still very present in, depending on where I'm reading and what I'm reading. And, um, you know, I have this poem about Michael Jordan pushing off uh, in, the, in the finals mm -hmm. and against Byron Russell in 97, who played for the Jazz. And when I read it in Utah, I read it once in Salt Lake City. And without even thinking, you know, I was like, well, this is, you know, it was, it was early in the tour for Fortune for Disaster. It was kind of, and that poem was a poem that had gotten a lot of momentum. People were like, we love this poem. And so I was like, I'm just going to read it to open my set. And I read it. And halfway through it in Utah, I was like, as I'm reading it out loud, my brain is thinking, you didn't think this one through. <laughs> stop, stop, man. <laughs> it's like, you're too far in to stop, but you didn't think this through. Same when I read it in Chicago. When I read it in Chicago, it's like, ah, you didn't think this through. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that I can curate and align myself towards what I most hope um, will put me in good favor with an audience, but I, that's because I'm a relentless people pleaser. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, and that's where some of the antagonism right. for me came from. Yeah. Like, I grew up as a people pleaser, you know. Um, and Are you no longer? I mean, I, well, I feel like it's coming from a different place now. Yeah. Like, when I was a kid, I did it out of fear. Um, like, a fear of rejection, just like a basic rank fear of rejection. Um, and now I, and now when I do it, it's because I feel like that is a space of grace or generosity, which can sound patronizing, but I don't mean it that way. It's more yeah. like, what do you need? There's like a difference. I feel like between being a host, yeah. right? The host of a house versus the host of a game show. Right. Oh, and yeah. So like, so like kid was game show host, you know, like, like you said, man, I, I love this group. I was like, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> have you have you heard have you heard, have you heard yeah. that song from them? Yeah, it was a long time ago. It just came out last week. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a long time because I listened to so much music. Like it was all that kind of stuff. Yes. Right. right? Yes. Right. It was like that uh, Looney Tunes thing where it's like, hey, hey, Chester, do you want to go? Hey, hey, Spike, do you want to go 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 chase cats? Nah. Yeah, yeah, that's stupid. We wouldn't want to joke chase no cats. But now it's much more like like I feel. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm worthless if I can't be of service. Right, like I, right, I had right. that moment of like wanting to be a person who opens spaces and makes spaces available yeah. in a different kind of way as an almost 50 year old person than right. as a like 12 year old or 15 year old person. What could I open then? But now I feel like there's lots of stuff that I can just be like, cool. But when it comes to the reading though, like, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I still find myself thinking about like, um, and I don't even know if this is a people pleasing impulse, but it's so often if we, if I can convince us through the process of reading, through what I'm choosing to read, how I'm choosing to read it, if I can convince us collectively that we are up against the door of 
a vulnerability and the stakes are so high that we have to push it together to open it. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's all, it's all a lie. It's all a trick, right? It's, yeah. for, it's all like a, I'm trying to get out of using the term magic trick because like two books in a row I've delved deep into magic tricks, <laughs> but it actually is, it is the trick itself to, to say by merely coming together. And this is the bullshit that I think I've tricked myself to believe through years of loving music and, and being in spaces where people are loving music. If I can trick us all into saying we came here to experience something and for a little while I get to be the conductor of that experience, mm -hmm. then I can maybe convince you that our shoulders are against the door and we have to find some collective vulnerable opening. Otherwise, and I don't even need, if I get, if I can trick you well enough, I don't even need to explain what the otherwise is. Right, right. right. You just say otherwise. Right. And then we push, hmm. if we're lucky. Hmm. Um, this makes me think about the difference between how these dynamics play out in live performance and reading and shared space and the, um, time delayed feedback you get from people who encounter your work on the page. Um, because I would say as a reader of show, I feel like there's a lot of antagonism, <laughs> uh, an exquisite antagonism toward the reader, just in the sense that, um, you know, some of us do try to read out loud mm -hmm. and there's a way that um, your choices of language um, it's just sucker punch after sucker punch, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are the words that you think I'm going to use and I'm just going to go askance from them or I'm going to flip their order or whatever. Yeah. And so um, it jacks up your mouth, yeah. you know? <laughs> and the skill that is required for you, I mean, even though they are your own words, to be able to perform them so um, well and briskly, you know, mm -hmm. the pace, the rhythm and everything. Um, you know, you've got your readers fucked up. <laughs> you know what I mean? As we sit there with that book and um, process the difference between what the words look like on the page, what they feel like when we dare to try to put them into our own mouths to mm -hmm. get some deeper mm -hmm. access to them. Um, and I just wonder if you ever get any feedback about that. And I would say in a similar way for you, um, Hank, when I read um, A Little Devil in America, I want to hear it. I, I, your voice is so much in it. I don't want your voice only to be something that I'm consuming with my eyes. I also want it in my ears. And so there are times when your background as a poet, um, I, I feel compelled to want to read your work out loud, just like when you started, you know, this is an essay, but it's, you know, there's an engine in that, that we can't fully appreciate if we don't get it sonically. Um, and so I just wonder how much you get to hear from your readers or engage with people who encounter your work on the page. And if anyone ever shares their reactions to it like that. I mean, one thing I want to say and, and then jump in is thinking about the sentence. Yeah. Thinking about a, sentence. a long sentence, thinking about your training with hypermasculine people. There's an athleticism yeah. to a long sentence if you're gonna read it aloud, mm -hmm. right? That there's, there's an athleticism, there's a breath control, there is, you know, there's a, a thing about capacity um, that I think is, is beyond the act of just trying to track the sentence the longer it goes, but then trying to intone it, mm -hmm. right? There's an athleticism, it's, it's, it's a marathon. Yeah. I think so. I just wanted to say that before you jumped in. Um, that's very kind. I think I'm drawn particularly to the long sentence because I like a song that fades out instead of hard stops. Hmm. Right? So here's an example. There's two quick examples. One, I don't know if it, I'm, I'm obsessed with the album Pet Sounds and I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with the making of it. Mm -hmm. So that means I've listened to the Pet Sound sessions, which is behind the scenes stuff like endlessly. And Brian Wilson says this thing about why he faded out God Only Knows. He's like, I want people to believe that even after it's done, it's still, still going, going on somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, you yeah. listen to a song like that or a song like Knocks Me Off My Feet by Stevie Wonder, right? Which like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I shouldn't begin talking about Stevie Wonder because I won't be able to stop. But <laughs> Knocks Me Off My Feet 
is miraculous because 70% chorus, Mm -hmm. 70% just like in in a chorus that is not actually, it's just this kind of breathless repetition of a very Mm -hmm. long sentiment that rotates and rotates and rotates. And one might believe when the song ends that it is actually still unfurling somewhere beyond here and elsewhere. The long sentence, I think, has that same impact. There's the parts of Little Devil where there's like no punctuation and it's just a block of text and there's no period at the end. I'm thinking about how, in writing that, I'm thinking about how I can convince you through this process that the ending is actually not the end of the page. Mm -hmm. That is where you are exposed to what appears to be an ending, but there's a continuation of it still humming in and elsewhere, right? And I... I think I grew up most loving songs that just didn't stop, that that kind of faded down mm-hmm. or faded down and then looped up to a to a, a heavenly place where they're still continuing. Like I think the song God Only Knows is still mm-hmm. um, still happening yeah. in a different place. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot, first of all, that was, that was beautiful. Um, I think a lot about um, we were talking about this briefly earlier, drum machines. Yeah. Um, and so some real like prosody, English prosody geekery, right? So like the writer Louis Turco argues that if you put four syllables in English next to each other, even if they're all hard accent syllables, like just say four nouns, one of them gets demoted because the English voice doesn't like to hear three hard accents in a row. Um, unless it's a list, right? But then you have these little pauses, this comma. And one of the things that I actively do in my work is something that I call drum machine prosody, Mm -hmm. which is like, imagine each word in a poem is mapped out over drum pads. So you're kind of like, show, 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 go, show, go, show, go, 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 show, go, show, go, show. Like there's no change in inflection. So sometimes if I'm lining up, and I started doing this in Buck Studies. Mm. At the, and that and it's interesting because Buck Studies, between the stagger, stagger put work in poem and the Eche Caniculus poem, Eche Caniculus was about the sentence, not about the line. It wasn't written as a prose poem, but it was about the sentence. Right. And so that's when I really began seeing what would happen if I put four hard accented words in a row. And what happens then is typically you've got to make a different kind of syntax to accommodate that in English. But I'm like, this is pro- 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 so I can do that. I can play with that. So some of it is to the ear, I think. There's not a pause built in, because they're usually not lists. They're not necessarily adjective noun, adjective, or adjective, adjective, and adjective noun. There's some other combination. And so when you read it, that mouthfeel, what Donald Hall called Milk Tongue, right, yeah. right? But the person I think of whenever I think about mouthfeel, honestly, is the rapper Ludacris. Huh. I don't think there's a rapper who loves speaking as much as Ludacris. Like maybe there's now, but like up to that point, like right. if I recollect right, then you sound like dirt. But I guess what you don't, you know, won't hurt. I mean, he just loves, I mean, he just loves, it's like nougat in his mouth. Yeah. And so like for me, there's like this sensual level in a poem that is, you know, when you take away metaphors in, in contemporary American poetry and you take away other figures of speech and you take away images, I gotta have something there or else people are like, why am I reading th- this chalkboard? Why am, why am I just scraping my nails across the chalkboard? So the sound becomes not an image of sound. I'm not saying, I write the word tree, now think of a tree. Mm-hmm. I want the, the, the shape of the letters themselves to be an actual image that you're looking at, not an image that you conceptualize away from the poem. And so the sound has to do the same thing. So I want, that the fact that people do read them is like beautiful to me. Not because I'm imagining myself, I'm not imagining struggling someplace, but no, I'm like, yes, exactly. Exactly, like this, you're only getting part of the experience. Like that's why, you know, using, um, you know, homophones Mm -hmm. is is so important because if you don't hear them, you don't know that you're looking at a homophonic pun. Like, is this um, bass or bass, right? Right, right. You're like a homograph, that's a homograph, like a homophon. Is it there, there, or there? 
right? So all of those things become tools when you kind of constrain your usage of other devices. And so I really, I, first of all, I appreciate that you're reading them. And yeah, they, they, do, they do trick. Um, but, you know, blame that on like growing up right. in the 80s and 90s, yeah. right? <laughs> where like, you know, like all the rappers were like, more syllables. More syllables, more, more syllables. More syllables. <laughs> more syllables. There are not enough syllables. Can I can I real quick say one quick thing about Stevie Wonder? Please. Yes. <laughs> no, not Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I, I don't tell this story a lot because I can't talk about like where I got this from. If people are like, where'd you get that? So I got I got obsessed with so for those who know Stevie Wonder's music, sometimes he would play all the shit on his songs would not credit himself, right. right? He would make up names or like pass a credit on to someone else. And so I asked someone for the isolated drum tracks from every 70s Stevie Wonder album so that I could find where you can hear him playing drums. And you could, I don't know why I did this. This was not for a project. It was just, I wanted, I wanted it. Um, and so I got this hard drive with all isolated drum tracks. And you can tell when Stevie Wonder is playing the drums because on these isolated tracks, you can hear him humming along in his earpiece, mm. right? And I think about this when I think about the long sentence and the ending song because the reveal is that he knows where the elsewhere is. Yeah. The humming, the person humming knows where the elsewhere is. The architect, there's a difference between writing a song <laughs> for the people and writing a song for yourself, right? If you know what unlocks the song, then who gives a fuck who else loves it? You know, right. you figured it out. Right. And so much of my writing in the sentence form, I talked about this, we talked about the long sentence as a form of escape, where it's like, I've trapped myself in this room and I gotta figure out how to get out so the sentences get longer because I'm looking for the exit. But once I, the reality is I already know where the exit is. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like Stevie kind of humming along, I know where the exit is already. And the matter, the matter of, um, the matter of getting there is how can I get there in a way that is both pleasurable mm -hmm. and uh, not wholly draining. And I think about that. I think about hearing Stevie humming while playing the drums on Knocks Me Off My Feet because he already knows. He already knows where he's getting off. You know? That's Yeah, absolutely. I lost that hard drive too, unfortunately. I don't what? know where that shit is. It's like, I, it's like, yeah, I don't know. I think, well, uh, we don't need to get into it. I think. <laughs> Uh, it's a whole, it, I would get way too personal if I talked about what I think happened to it, but I think, I think I know who has it. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. I, you know, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that comes out in some future essay in, in beautifully redacted form. Um, <laughs> we have just a few minutes left and I, we did promise a little bit of opportunity for audience engagement. So I'd like to, um, open the floor for that. Yes. Yes, you may. Oh, great. Uh, hi. Um, so my question for both, both of you is how much is place um, in influencing your work? And the reason I ask that is because I'm a big fan of your podcast, The Tiny Small Joys, and listening to that made me want to visit Columbus, Ohio so badly. And so I'm just wondering like, how that influences Quick restate of the question is how does place influence the author's yeah. work? I, you know, I, Columbus is, um, I'm trying to most times sketch a portrait of a city that does not look like the city it looked like when I loved it most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to talk about memory as privilege is to also, it's, I'm, I'm privileged to have lived in this place I love when I could love the, the architecture, when I could love the places that uh, made me who I am. And so, you know, Columbus is, yeah, if, um, Columbus is a, is a really beautiful container in which I think I do my best work. And it's because, um, the people, all of my earliest mentors were there. I, I learned on Poetry Over Mike's there. I, people there loved me before I wrote anything, before like people will love me, Lord willing, inshallah, people will love me if I stopped writing tomorrow. And I think that's important. Like it was, you know, a funny, the, the day that, um, the day the MacArthur was announced, I was also supposed to pick up um, some 
some like some shit from a bakery, my neighborhood bakery. And I was late to pick it up because of, you know, the fanfare and all that. And they gave my shit away, you know what I mean? It, <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled up, you know, mm-hmm. it is it's one it's wild to like have this national this immense national attention and I pull up to the spot and I'm like, yo, where's the cakes and all that I ordered? And it's like, you didn't show you, it's an hour late. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is a baker I went to since I was a little kid. And it was like, you know, the deal is we're giving you shit away. And I, I was really, I was like, this is why I stay. You know, this is why I'm always going to stay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because to them, I'm just the motherfucker who wasn't there at two o'clock. Right, right, right. No. I mean, my answer to this, I grew up in Altadena, um, which right pressed up against the uh, San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and so when we would drive in Altadena, you know, the mountains would do what they do to radio broadcasts. And because there were so many different, like, communities, like, we could be listening and, like, listening to, like, an R&B station. But then if you took, a r- if you took like, a right off of Altadena Drive and say, you know, you're going up Raymond a little further, like, suddenly it would be, like, Russell Radio. But it was just kind of phased in and out. And so there are these moments where it sounded like they were almost on top of each other. And I think that the kind of switches in diction and like the changes in sort of rhythm or tone, that's like, that's my entire childhood listening to the radio, driving up to my grandmother's house or driving around town. So like the constant shifting and yet it all holds as this place, Altadena, Los Angeles, Southern California, however you want to frame it. So that to me showed that by definition, like I didn't like explode when that happened. I could manage it. Right. And I think that that has a lot to do with why I like sample based music, particularly people like De La Soul or Public, who use really, or, or Mad Lib, you know? Um, because that just sounds like driving around, listening to music. It stops in the middle and you hear violins all of a sudden and then it goes back to whatever it was. You're hearing heavily gated drums from an 80s song. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. I hear your um, readings now kind of as mm-hmm. um, radio play. Mm-hmm. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. I think we have time for one more question. I have his ears waving. Get the yes. arm waving. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, a critical element of your work is, is the performance aspect. Mm-hmm. Performance invites interpretation. Mm-hmm. It's one thing for us to, to hear it and to appreciate it and to absorb it, but how do you want others to read and interpret your work? I assume mimic, you don't want them to repeat it mm. as you spoke it. Mm-hmm. But I'd be curious how you would as a guide for whether it's young people or adults, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. take on your work. I think for me, so there were about five years where I was reading poems from my second book, The Black Automaton. And The Black Automaton was the first really persistent use of what I call performative typography, arranging the type all over the page. There was never a master reading of any of those poems. Whenever I would read them, I would pass out a photocopy or the book and a pen, and I would say, okay, sequence the poem. What order do you think I should read it in? And so you put one here, and then you put two here. Maybe you put two, three, four in the same place. And so I'd have to read them in whatever way it was sequenced. And what I learned during that is that no two people given an open field poem will read it the same. And that opened it up for me to then give myself permission to, if I did that with a poem, I could do whatever I felt that day. Sometimes people would lose a whole stanza. They wouldn't see it or they wouldn't pay attention to it. And I just didn't read it. Um, what, one of the best ways I can answer this story is I started doing these, answer this question is I started doing these poems that were more like literal collage pieces. And I was in Philly and folks were, I, I was visiting the poet's house and they talked about how they read it together as a class. Mm-hmm. Not like, not like, what do you think this is? Or not like, you take this part, you take this, but they read it collectively. Mm-hmm. Now the common line in poetry is poetry is, you know, you know, individual, or you know, you, you come to a space and you get to read it, but it's a lonely work. For me, the idea that I had written something where it was no longer the question of how would I do it, but it was the question of how this group of people yeah. sat together going, oh, what, let's do this like this. And that's, that's what I'm after. Like, if I've done my job, you are less likely to think that this poem, you know, is, 
is, is about, I don't know, a spring day in Maine, then it is a satirical poem about the Middle Passage. Like, you're, if I've done my job, you're not going to look at this and be like, well, this could be anything. Yeah. Right? Like, if I feel like I've done my job and that's my intention, then I'm going to do things that tr- sort of push us toward that. Right? But the common thing, and it's true, like, once you kind of put it out there, you're... You're, you're leaving it up, you're leaving it out. And I mean, to me, that's the beautiful thing. It's why I write opera, because opera forces that level of collaboration. And also, it's constantly the aesthetic equivalent of going to the bakery and your cake's not being there. <laughs> because, because the composer's like, yeah, I like this part, so I made it repeat five times. Well, dramaturgically, that don't make, yeah, yeah, I like this part, and this is an opera. Yeah, yeah. Right. And every time I talk to like, you know, engaging in an opera, this is a very egalitarian thing. I'm like, so like when it's done, if I say, I think it needs more hi hat, that's going to be cool. Right. No, but I do that because it forces me out of this position of being able to dictate. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, this is going to remain PG to PG 13, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about D'Angelo's Untitled. Ooh. <laughs> um, the problem with, this is a song that I've heard covered a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And the problem with most covers of D'Angelo's Untitled is that, <laughs> my initial problem with it is that they're all done by men. <laughs> but, 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 even that aside, um, the other problem is that people approach that song thinking that it's about sex when it's actually about curiosity. Mm. Right now, of mm. course, those two things can intersect as they do in that song when sung by D'Angelo. Yeah. Right. But without leaning on the central vehicle of the song, which is the question and making it about this kind of clinical interaction, which, to be frank, like the lyrics when when presented yeah. on the page are like these this uh, unappealing clinical interaction. Yeah. But it's because D'Angelo has understood that the song is about curiosity. It's about a shared curiosity and a type of questioning. And understanding that, understanding that question is the key that unlocks the performance of that song. And no one else has that key. Mm-hmm. Only he has that key. Or at least to this point, it seems that only he is, the, he is the only one who has that key. Right? Now, some of this is the fault of the aesthetics of the video and all that, whatever. But what most songs that people think are about one thing are simply about creating the conditions for that one thing to thrive. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. FK Twigs is two weeks, for yeah, example, oh right? A, a sexy song, not really all that much about sex, about creating the conditions mm-hmm. under which the miraculous can happen. And as Marvin Gaye said on the lighter notes of Let's Get It On, to make music that leads to someone having this kind of wonderful, miraculous interaction is, is a source of luck, right? Mm-hmm. And so to answer your question that, you know, to be frank, my work clearly is like not about not sexy at all. I write maybe some of the unsexiest work uh, in contemporary American writing. <laughs> that's a that's a good stand to take. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, yeah. Sadly, notoriously unsexy work from me. But I do think though that what I most want people to understand is that aboutness is a trick aboutness is a game it's what we tell you know we're talking about this with the book where it's like i've tricked myself into saying this is a book about basketball that shit ain't about basketball right basketball is the room that i am beckoning you into but i actually have the key because the key to it is the thing that only i have that cannot be replicated Mm -hmm. i cut the key i built the door and i opened it and you got to come in and see what the rest of the shit's about and so that's kind of where I'm at always is this, this um, that goes into the performance of it. But in, in what I want people to take from it is that we, to divorce ourselves from this idea of aboutness as a singular monolithic thing, I think serves all of us as readers, as writers, as performers, as, uh, as interpreters of other people's work, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and D'Angelo is the container I use for that because mm-hmm. oftentimes I hear people cover Untitled and I go, this isn't it. This is missing the ingredient that is that makes this song, that drops the engine into the song, which is this constant questioning, this constant curiosity, and a deep, deep, deep insecurity, which is actually the engine. The engine inside of the engine of that song is a deep and relentless insecurity. And I write 
unfathomably unsexy work, but I write incredibly insecure work. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a rather profound last word for this <laughs> session. <laughs> respectful of the schedule of the festival so I thank you all for coming um, Thanks, thank everyone. you um, to our authors thank you to the audience thank you to the National Book Foundation thank you to the Bay Area Book Festival um, please know that you will have the opportunity to support these authors by purchasing their books Hanif Abdurraqib's uh, A Little Devil in America Douglas Kearney's show Please do support them, support Marcus Books by uh, heading out to the tent where you'll have the opportunity to swoon over these extraordinary <laughs> authors um, and thinkers. Thank you so much for sharing a Thank little you. glimpse of your <laughs> process and your product.